Welcome to the Washington Post special report on COVID-19. I'm Libby Casey and I'm the politics and accountability anchor at the Washington Post. I'm joining you from my home in Washington, DC. Thanks so much for joining me today. So what do we now know about COVID-19 and how it affects the body? Who's getting sick and why do some people have mild cases while other people die? We're gonna talk all about that today, but first here are some of the top stories that we're watching. US coronavirus cases have surpassed 1 million and that's nearly a third of the world's reported COVID-19 cases. As we learn more about the virus, the Centers for Disease Control has updated its list of symptoms to watch for, and they include things like losing your sense of smell as well as a sore throat. And a new study shows that patients with certain types of cancer are three times more likely to die than of COVID-19 than non-cancer patients, so we are watching that story. My first guest is Joel Achenbach, who you can see here, science and politics reporter at the Washington Post. Um, Joel, thank you so much uh, for joining us. So glad you're here. Make sure to unmute yourself and we'll get started. Um, Joel, you know, it seems like this has been going on for so long, but it, this has only been about four months since it's the first cases were reported. It is unbelievable. What do we know now that we didn't know or perhaps even did know just a couple months ago? Well, what we know, first of all, is that we don't have to worry anymore about whether this is going to become a pandemic because it has. If you think back to just really two months ago, the question was, well, you know, what's going to happen? Is this going to go around the world? And the World Health Organization was reluctant to say that this is a pandemic. Well, it, it became a pandemic real fast. And... Um, in, in, in a dramatic way, there, if, if you go back to the beginning of April, I think actually the, the 31st of March, uh, we only had, you know, what, a thousand cases or something like that in the U.S. Uh, uh, it was still a small number, maybe it's a thousand deaths. Now it's over 50,000. It, it, we see, have seen the explosive spread of this, the, uh, the tragic deaths, you know, the, the way it has impacted New York City in particular in some of these urban counties. Um, as the models said it, it would, it hasn't affected everywhere the same, but um, we're still trying to figure out basic things like, well, exactly how deadly is the virus? I mean, like if you get it, what are your chances? Um, and of course that depends on a lot of things. You know, how old are you? You know, if you're, if you're a lot older, you're, it's, it's, it's tougher. If you have an underlying chronic disease, it's tougher. And so um, we are kind of narrowing down a little bit on the, on the comorbidities, which ones are the most important. Um, you and well, I let's talk about that because we've known for a long time that like the elderly are more susceptible to uh, to, to having a severe case. Um, and uh, we're going to go over those new coronavirus symptoms in just a little while. But first, who is the most susceptible? The elderly, people with pre-existing conditions. Um, yes, and so it's important for people to understand that um, anyone can get the virus, right? I mean, it's not if you're if you're young, if you're a kid. You're not immune to the virus, but in terms of serious outcomes, hospitalization, um, uh, there are young people who get hospitalized. They don't tend to go into the, I, the ICU, but they do get hospitalized. There's a lot of hospitalized young people, you know, young adults, you know, 20 to 50. The most serious outcomes, though, are uh, in um, older folks over 60, and these comorbidities, which we've all talked about, include. Um, um, you know, heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, obesity is a big factor. One reason we're seeing the problems we have in the U.S. Uh, compared to some other countries may be because we're, we're, we tend to have a much higher rate of obesity, like 42% of the adult population in the U.S. is obese, which is off the charts. Um, uh, so uh, th there's, but there's no question that the virus it, it picks on people who are weakened in some way. It doesn't mean you can't have these anomalies where a young, healthy person can also get sick. And we've, we've written about that uh, this week. My colleague Ariana wrote about uh, the, the, the strokes, you know, that, that have been seen in some young people who have COVID. Um, it, there's, there's a lot of weird things about this virus. That why does it attack the, the kidneys and the heart, uh, not just the lungs? It's a respiratory virus, but you know, what's it doing messing in people's brains. Uh, so it's, um, we're still learning about what it does. But 
uh, I would I would say that even as we have all these uncertainties and there are these kind of strange effects like like the blood clotting, you know, why is that happening? Um, it's doing what you would have predicted it would have done back in January when it was emerging in Wuhan, uh, in, in, in uh, Hubei province in China. It's not like it's, it's you know, caught us completely by surprise. You know, it is a, um, a novel coronavirus that uh, it can latch onto certain kinds of cells in your upper respiratory system and sometimes penetrate deep into your, your lungs. And when that happens, your immune system overreacts. You have a cytokine mm -hmm. storm. So th th this is not this is not science fiction. This is kind of uh, you know nature at work. Mm. Yeah. Okay. You, you you use this term cytokine storm, which I've heard a lot, but I want to dig into what exactly it means. Um, so you know the body has this overreaction sometimes, where the immune system sort of goes into overdrive. Do we know why the body's doing that? Do we know why that is a problem for some patients? Well, I can tell you how it was explained to me, and I'm just an old newspaper reporter, okay? So I'm not a doctor, and, and, but, I, but some really good doctors have tried to explain it. Um, first of all, when you get older, your immune system becomes uh, a di dysregulated was the term that I, I heard. Um, and it, 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 it's, it was described to me as kind of like having a symphony in which the different parts, the different instruments are not playing in sync the way they used to. And a young person, your immune system is, is, is more orderly. You get beyond a certain age, you kind of escape the protective uh, umbrella of Darwinian evolution because you're so old, you've kind of out, you, you, you're kind of on your own there, right? And so your, your system isn't, isn't, um, uh, evolved for all kinds of different pathogens or, or, you know, your body starts to fall apart and your immune system is part of that. It's just the aging process. And so what happens is the, the, um, the cytokines, these various cells go in there and try to wipe out the virus, but they do too good of a job. They get rid of the virus and they don't shut off and they start causing uh, your blood vessels in the, the lungs to be leaky. And you start filling up with fluid. You basically drown. And so part of the treatment is, well, how do we shut that off? How do we kind of calm down that immune system response? What, what can you do to calm it down? And that is the kind of you know, medical research that's being done right now. And hopefully someone a month from now, if they wind up in the hospital, will have better treatments than they have today. That's what I certainly would hope for those of us who've never had the, the virus yet and might, might get it in the future. Well, that was part of the justification of trying to social distance and slow this down to, you know, flatten the curve of, as we've all heard so much about, to reduce the, the, the load on hospitals and their staffs, but also in hopes that our knowledge would evolve and the treatments would evolve. And we will talk more extensively about treatments with one of our colleagues, Chris Rowland, later on in this hour, because he's been reporting on drugs that are being, you know, tested for treatment and this question of a vaccine. I, I want to talk to you more, Joel, about this 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 look into like what exactly COVID-19 is doing to the body because we all know that it attacks the lungs but our colleagues Lenny Bernstein and Carolyn Johnson, Sarah Kaplan and Laura McGinley had this fascinating piece looking at the 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 the, the rest of the body and how the virus may also be attacking the heart, the kidneys, uh, the liver. Um, so so what do we know about how suffering and symptoms can also manifest besides what happens to the lungs? Well, I think that's, you know, that's the great question that everyone wants to answer. It's also the kidneys. One of the things that we reported a couple of weeks ago was um, from the hospital data that we, that we obtained from a company that does all this tracking of all the hospitals and nursing homes is a really high uh, comorbidity with kidney disease and chronic kidney disease and kidney injuries, acute kidney injuries. Um, so, you know, what it looks like is that if you have an underlying illness, um, the virus uh, it tends to make it, make it worse. Now, I mean, the, to my knowledge, the virus, um, it's still basically the, the kind of cells that it binds to are in the upper respiratory system, uh, uh, typically. Um, but this whole disease progression it, it, it depends on, on who you are, but it takes many weeks. There's this very mysterious second week phenomenon in which people seem to be doing okay for a week. And the second week, 
they go downhill very quickly. That is probably uh, a case of the immune system overreacting in that second week and uh, it, it kind of just pummeling your own body. So, but as to your question is, you know, why is it doing this to the heart? Why is it doing this to the kidneys or, or the, the other organs? Uh, I don't think that people know. It's, it's um, uh, th this phenomenon of, of a lot of blood clotting that's been seen it, anecdotally. I haven't seen a science paper on that, but that is what you're hearing from the front lines and what the post is reporting on. Yeah, so our colleague Ariana Anjung Cha uh, did this dive into the question of clots. And, and, you know, this is like the opposite of what would happen with an Ebola or dengue fever, where you have those fevers where you have uncontrollable bleeding. Bleeding rather. So, so this is clotting, and of course, clotting can lead to strokes. And as she reported, this is something that anecdotally doctors are talking about. So it is being looked into, and they're trying to figure out what exactly is going on there. Um, but at this and, point, and just to follow up on that, people, you know, when they when they read these stories, they should not jump to a conclusion that they should take a blood thinning medication. They should talk to their doctor before they do something like that. You know, we're all we're all a little bit in the dark and trying to figure out, well, how do we live? What do we do? What's the best thing to, to, to do? I mean, and part of it is um, a mental health challenge, a psychological challenge uh, to um, come up with a pandemic plan and a way of getting through the day that, that works for you so you can sleep through the night. And um, every expert I've talked to on the psychological side of it always says, um, you know, limit your exposure to the news. I mean, it doesn't mean, don't read the news. We want you to read the Washington Post or or, or watch your the your program, uh, but people should not uh, obsess over it to the point that it's disabling them. Uh, if that makes any sense, um, and also keep in mind what the statistics say, which is that most people can recover from this uh, at home. You know, in most cases are mild to moderate when you do get it. So. Uh, it's for most people. This is this is um, going to be something that we're all, we're going to get through. So um, not to be alarmist, but there was also some reporting that Britain's National Health Authority has uh, has been sort of raising some concerns about children and potential complications. It's important to point out that um, the alert they're putting out has a small rise in the number of cases that have this sort of strange clinical picture. Um, so, you know, as you as a reporter, Joel, what are you going to be watching for? What questions are you asking? Um, because so far, children can be carriers of this, but um, just... Based yeah, on the demographics, they haven't been as likely to get very sick or thankfully die. So what I would say about that is that it's it's important to to uh, understand is that r reported rise, that anecdotal rise in um, those inflammatory symptoms in children, is that simply reflecting the spread of of the virus? You know, the the, the curve they're having in in the UK. Um, so that you would expect if there was some small percentage of kids who had that response, it would be going up. It doesn't mean that the virus is changing its disease progression. It's not, the virus isn't mutating to get worse. I mean, people always wanna know that. There's no evidence that that's the case. So some children do um, uh, get sick with it. It's really rare. I, I always encourage people to look at the, the larger cohort. So if you have you know, six cases of something in for example, in DC, in this area, we've got you know six million people. Um, if you have a handful of cases, uh, that that tells you that something is possible, but it's not likely. It's you know it's literally one. It's, you know six out of six million is one in a million. So um, just in terms of how we think about about risk and uh, what's an acceptable risk and what should we be worried about, I would say that, that you know if if you're walking down the sidewalk and you see someone coming towards you who's not wearing a mask, don't jump out into the street because there could be a car coming, right? I mean, you know, try to, you know, keep your, your do your risk analysis there. Um, but with, with, with the children, one thing that we know is that in terms of fatalities, it's very rare. In fact, I've looked at the CDC's numbers on this and below the age of 25, um, uh, the, the, there's just, there's just the total country of the first, in the first month or so of, of this big, big outbreak here in the U.S., there were a couple of dozen people under the age of 25 who died of this. But that compares to 
thousands, tens of thousands older than that. So young people, for some reason, do seem to have a fair bit of protection. Let's talk about the new symptoms list from the CDC. Now, here's what they had before. It was a very short list before, just shortness of breath, cough, and fever. That's now been expanded, and you can see it on your screen. Chills, shaking with the chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, and that loss of taste or smell, something we've been hearing about, uh, doctors talk about and patients talk about for quite a while now. Um, why is it significant, Joel, to see, these, see, to see the CDC expand their list of symptoms? Well, it's important for people to know that just because they're not coughing, you know, or just because they don't have a fever, it doesn't mean that they don't have an infection. They don't, they don't have a clinical symptom. And I think that one of the regrettable parts of this whole thing, if you go back two months ago or six weeks ago, some people couldn't get tested unless they met very stringent criteria for, uh, for, for, for the symptoms. I think there's a lot of emphasis, emphasis also on fever as a um, sign that you have it. So people would you know, say, well, we'll check people for fever before we'll let them in on, on the airplane or before we'll let them come into our building or our, our restaurant. Well, you can be have no fever but still have this, this virus. And I think expanding it and letting people know that this, um, this disease manifests itself in all kinds of different ways, including these things like the muscle pain um, that you hear about. And the people I've talked to who've had it, uh, they report all over the map their symptoms. I mean, some you know, terrible headaches. Mm -hmm. um, I hear fatigue a lot. I mean, does this-, this yeah, like, And that's- Are you surprised that fatigue was left off the list? You know, I, I don't know if, if they've ever specified a fatigue or not, but that's one I, I always hear people just, you know, wiped up, feel like they got hit by a truck, you know, and um, and just very, very tired. So, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll ping the CDC on that and say, hey, get with it. Um, but, I, you know, I but the, but the, the headache, the muscle pain and this weird thing with the loss of, of taste and smell, which um, I don't think anyone's ever totally figured that one out. It's it's, you know. It's not the flu, it's a different bug, it's a different virus, and we are still wrestling with it. But like you said at the opening, uh, Libby, um, I can't believe it's only been four months. I feel like we, that it's been longer than that. I don't know, maybe because I do coronavirus every day of the week, you know, and it's just been a such a marathon. Now, hi, Emma. Uh, Welcome, Emma. Emma Brown, investigative reporter, joining us. Uh, Emma, thanks so much for being with us. You know, you've been part of this team looking at deaths in the United States, and you've done some fascinating reporting looking at the early weeks of the coronavirus epidemic and when it did come to the United States, that, that there were a recorded number of excess deaths. So first of all, what's an excess death? Great question. Um, so it, it, we teamed up with a, a group of epidemiologists from Yale's School of Public Health, as well as a couple of other institutions. And they um, they looked back at several years of data uh, week by week at, at um, how many people were dying in the nation and then in each state. And they come up with basically um, a, an estimate for how many people should be dying in a normal year this year each week. And then we compare that to how many people actually died according to data that the CDC is putting out on a rolling basis, updating every Friday. Um, and what we see is, so excess deaths is the difference between those two. If you sort of subtract out the number of people who you thought were going to die, um, it's all those up, up, uh, above and beyond that number. And so um, with this team of epi uh, epidemiologists, the, the estimate is about 15,400 excess deaths or additional deaths than over and above what would be expected. That was just from March 1st to April 4th. So it's hard because the, the, everything changes so quickly right now. But if you think back to April 4th, that was really just when um, the uh, pandemic was beginning to be, uh, you know, deaths were beginning to rise more quickly outside of New York, you know, in, in New York City and outside of New York City. So we expect that when we, you know, when new data is released on Friday, that number may, uh, may increase. So Emma, you know, we're not reporting that like each of those deaths is is definitively also a coronavirus case. So talk to us about why that number is still so important. 
right, this analysis says nothing about why those people died, what the cause was. But in any pandemic, this is what scientists do when they're initially trying to understand what the, what the overall impact of the pandemic is. Um, because there are people, for, so as um, Joel was talking about, you know, early on, it was very hard to get a test. And there were people who were dying who were not being tested. Um, uh, so that number may include people who died and were not tested. It may include people who died and because they, they were not infected, but they didn't go to the hospital because they feared getting infected in the hospital. So they, they died of some other thing, some other cause that where they didn't get the treatment they otherwise would have gotten. Um, so, you know, that number, it's also affected by, for example, traffic fatalities, like how fewer people are driving right now. And we have lots of, uh, of pieces of data that suggest that traffic fatalities are going to be down in a lot of places over this period. So that would bring, you know, that would bring the number of overall deaths down a little bit. So it, it's affected by lots of different um variables, but the reason it matters, it's because it gives us sort of the best global view of, of, of what's happening with death in our country right now. And then the fact that it's so much higher than would normally be expected suggests that we just have not captured in our official sort of death tolls, the, uh, full, the full impact of the pandemic. Joel, what questions does this raise for you? You know, I, I was thinking about, um, the, reporting we've done on opioids uh, over the last several years, but last in the last year in particular. And um, there was progress on driving down deaths from opioid uh, addiction circa 2018, but it started to tick back up in 2019 and it's still going up, I believe. And I, I do wonder um, in terms of, you know, when this whole shutdown happened and, and fear of hospitals. I do wonder what's happening to people who have addiction, who in many cases might be homeless uh, or kind of living on the edge. I think, I think those numbers are, you know, it, it would not surprise me if, if those numbers rose too. these sort of secondary knock-on effects um, uh, from lack of mental health access, you know, lack of support groups, people who rely on going to, uh, you know, a 12-step meeting and, and can't do that for some reason. A lot of people are trying to fill that in through Zoom and things like that, but um, I think a lot of people are having a hard time. And um, uh, it's a, it's a everything we've learned about this pandemic and this virus says that it's important to try to be as healthy as possible uh, and to take care of yourself because something can come along, and if you are in bad shape, you're going to have a, t a tough time uh, fighting off. Of the effects of a virus like this. So, you know, um, I think we're, we should all feel motivated in that way. So, Emma, you know, the numbers you're looking at, it's data from the National Center for Health Statistics. Um, what are they trying to track and how are they sort of, you know, revising or updating numbers? And how is this different from what like the CDC might be tracking or looking at? Right. So, um, the number that we sort of look at as our, as the death toll, you know, that's broadcast on our our site um, on any network TV news show you might be watching or by the CDC. That comes from state health departments um, and it's sort of a compilation of reports from states. Uh, and throughout much of the pandemic has been based basically only on the deaths of people who were tested and, and got a confirmation that they had the, uh, the virus, um, which we know to be an undercount, as we said, right? Like uh, scientists know in any pandemic that um, the number of people who actually get tested is way fewer than the number of people who, uh, who die. Um, so that's, that's, that's that number, the CDC number and the one that you're sort of used to looking at. And Emma, we're looking at it right now. You can see it right there on your screen. And that's sort of looking at this one more, you know, a million confirmed cases in the States and then reported deaths above 57,000 at this point. So what the, the National Center for Health Statistics tracks overall deaths, um, like deaths for any cause, uh, which is partly what our analysis is based on. Uh, and they are also tracking death certificate data. So that's any death certificate that has COVID-19 on it. COVID-19 uh, death certificates, you can get that, you can have that on your death certificate because you had a positive test or because a doctor considered your exposure, your symptoms, and felt like it was pretty certain that you had it. So you, it includes a, a larger basket of people basically than this number that we're used to looking at. Um, so 
as, as of April 4th, which is when our analysis ended, the, the, the number you're looking at your screen would have said only about 8,000 people had died of, corona, of, of the, the novel coronavirus compared to this 15,000 extra people that we had found actually uh, are estimated to have died during that time. So it was like uh, about a half. Um, so uh, what that suggests is that this number that we're looking at here is, pro is, is likely also an undercount. We know that that 8,000 number that we were looking at on April 4th was an undercount now because of state uh, jurisdictions like New York City. So New York City has uh, sort of went back and revised their official count. As of that date, they were only counting about 2,500 people as having count a diet of COVID-19. Uh, and now they're including um, people who, who probably died of COVID-19, you know, it appeared on their death certificate. Uh, they're also counting all the people who, whose tests didn't come back, um, who didn't get confirmation until, uh, you know, days later. We know there have been those lags in testing and reporting. And that doubled the number of people who, who are now uh, believed to have died of COVID-19 in the, in the period that we were looking at. So these are all signs, um, you know, as the, as the um, uh, understanding of this disease improves as reporting of test, uh, test results and reporting of probable cases and deaths improves, um, this number we're looking at on the screen is likely to increase. Um, Joel, you, you guys have both been using the term we hear so often, the novel coronavirus. Can we just take a step back and, and address why we use that term? Well, um, this virus naturally uh, circulates in bats, or it's descended from a virus that naturally circulates in bats, not in human beings. And so there are already, prior to this, uh, at least four coronaviruses circulating in human beings that cause colds. This is one that has never been in the human species until it somehow made this leap. This, 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 it's a zoonotic disease. This zoonosis is when you know, it, the virus goes from an animal into human beings. It might have happened a number of times until suddenly it kind of got a purchase, a foothold, and started to spread. Um, it, it could have happened probably last year, um, maybe November of last year in China somewhere. We don't really know the origin of it. Um, as far as conspiracy theories, you know, it was a bioweapon. That's not really necessary to go down that road because there are a lot of zoonotic viruses. Um, but when it, when it when we say it's novel, what we mean is we don't have any experience with it. We don't have, we are, no one has immunity to it. Unless you get it and then you get over it, and now you have immunity. And that's one of the big questions. How many people have already had it? It's probably way more than the, than the case count. Um, you know, it could be, you know, 10% in some places like New, New York City it looks like it's 21%. It could be over 10% in parts of New York State. Um, but w w without immunity to it, it means anyone can get it. The virus can just go, go through the whole, you know, building and infect everyone. It doesn't, it's not going to hit anyone with immunity, which is unlike a cold or something mm -hmm. that's already been in circulation, something that's not a novel virus. All right. Uh, Joel Achenbach, we're going to let you go. Emma, stay with us. Uh, coming up, we'll look at what's happening in Georgia, even as the governor there is calling for businesses to reopen. Some, including those in the African-American community, are raising concerns about just what that will mean for their health and welfare. Stay with us. These days, it's anything but business as usual. That's why working together is more important than ever. AT&T is committed to keeping you connected so you can keep your patients cared for your customers served, your students inspired, and your employees closer than ever. Our network is resilient. Our people are strong. Our job is to keep your business connected. It's what we've always done. It's what we'll always do. I'm Libby Casey and I'm joined by Emma Brown, investigative reporter and welcoming Vanessa Williams, national reporter. Vanessa, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Vanessa, you reported just a, a story about Georgia that even in its headline has just sort of this stunning quote um, from someone who, who you and the team talked to who lives in Georgia, who's questioning just how vulnerable Georgians are being made by the governor's decision uh, to reopen uh, their state. And this is Demetrius Young, a city commissioner. Um, and his question was, for Black folks, are you trying to kill us? So 
Vanessa, what are the concerns that that Mr. Young and others had about this opening process? I happen to be here today. So Mr. Young is in Albany, uh, Georgia, which is in Southwest Georgia, which is uh, one of the state's uh, rural spots. Uh, and Southwest Georgia happens to be uh, more populated by black people. Uh, they tend to be poor and it is one of the areas that is, uh, you know, that rivals other areas in the country for the per capita deaths. I believe the story that we did notes that out of 20 um, counties around the country that have the highest per rate of per capita deaths from COVID-19, five of them are in Southwest Georgia. And that is the area uh, that uh, Mr. Young comes from. So his, 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 his frustration is that the, the um, the region has been struggling mightily to uh, just to get its arms around and to, to stop and slow the spread, to bury its dead, to take care of sick people. There's only one hospital in that region uh, in Southwest Georgia. So he's like, look, we're, we're already struggling and now we're going to you know, uh, open businesses, which he is afraid will uh, once again sort of get the cycle going with regard to infections and hospitalizations and deaths. And that's what he meant by that quote, like, are you trying to kill us? And in particular, the, the businesses that the governor uh, in the first round cited for reopening, barbershops, beauty shops, tattoo parlors. These are places where people are trying to figure out, wait a minute, how do you social distance? You know, how do you protect yourself and your customers? So that's what he was alluding to. He's very frustrated. Emma, I want to bring this back to, to your reporting, um, because you, you and your colleagues were um, in touch with uh, a, a health director in New Orleans, Louisiana, another southern state that's wrestling with coronavirus cases, um, you know, trying to wrap their mind around just wh what the numbers mean, like the death rates and the numbers. So, so why is it important to, to really get a handle on causes of death during this time as people try to make decisions about what to do next, Emma? Right. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a couple reasons. There's the the folks who are trying to figure out what to do about the social distancing measures we have in place right now. Um, you know, all over the country, uh, leaders, elected leaders, are trying to uh, want to reopen, are trying to figure out when the appropriate time to do that is. So if we have a, a, a tr you know an undercount of the deaths, we, we don't have a good picture of what's actually happening uh, with the virus. And you know I think the fear uh, that um, Mr. Young and Vanessa's story is is voicing gets right to that. Like it, it, that's in a place where the, the deaths uh, are known to be high. Um, but there are a lot of places that have had very difficult access to testing where um, you know people are afraid that there are that the sort of the virus is having an impact that hasn't been seen and so that when these policy decisions get made are they really being made with the best data so that that is one of the reasons uh, that is that is perhaps the most important reason I think the the, the death count is also has a political um, you know sort of an undeniable political implications particularly for President Trump um, and so I think uh, there's a lot of um, back and forth um, about what about the the uh, accuracy of the death count that has um, political undertones to it. All right, Emma Brown, we're going to let you go. Thank you so much uh, for all your reporting and for spending time with us. Mm -hmm. Vanessa, this question of getting tested, you know, we, we keep hearing uh, from the White House that there are improvements to testing, that anyone can get a test has been what the president has been saying for, for quite a while now. But you open your story um, with a description of a woman named Cheryl Means, who's lost family members to coronavirus, who's a home healthcare worker, who was experiencing some symptoms, but could not get a test. Tell us about her situation. Well, uh, Ms. Means, as you, as you pointed out, um, she lost her mother and her aunt within days of each other in early April. I mean, literally within like five to six days of each other, her aunt died and her mother died. They were both in their 80s uh, and uh, they both you know, had underlying conditions, but nevertheless. And uh, shortly after that, or shortly before her, her uh, mother and aunt died, her sister, who is a little older than she is, fell ill. Uh, and she has been on a ventilator in, uh, in Alabama, as a matter of fact, because as I mentioned earlier, there's one hospital in the region. And they live sort of between those, th that hospital in, in Albany and the one in, in Alabama. Her sister is hospitalized in Alabama. She hasn't seen her since then. 
so Miss uh, so Miss Means was was real started to have uh, chest uh, pains. She thought, and she talked to her doctor, but because she wasn't coughing or she didn't have a fever or any of the other symptoms, he wasn't able to write her a a referral. So she so he sent her to a a county testing facility where somebody like her who works as a home health care aide should have been able to get a test. But once again, she gets over there, the nurse interviews her and says, well, you don't have a cough, you don't have a fever. And, and the nurse there told her the same thing. Her doctor says, you're probably just stressed. And mm -hmm. she's like, you know, I'm just, I would really just like to know to put my mind at rest, mm -hmm. but she can't get the test. And that is one of the, uh, and, and she, some people think she should be able to, but again, that that's the confusion, uh, the lack of sort of standards, the lack of uh, just not only accessibility, but you know, everybody sort of being on the same page about who should get tested and who shouldn't and why shouldn't she if she's, you know, on the front line, a frontline worker that way. Yeah. And, and just having any concern, you know, we're just posting up here again, the new CDC list of, uh, of identifiable symptoms of coronavirus. Um, but as we talked about with Joel earlier, fatigue is something that we hear from a lot of patients that's not on the list yet. Um, so, so there are there, there so this is an evolving and developing list. Not that the symptoms are changing, just that we're learning more about what the symptoms are. I so, um, yeah, go ahead, Vanessa. I want to point out that uh, in the new stimulus bill that passed last week, there is supposed to be additional money for testing. And in fact, the day after our story uh, published, the, the governor announced uh, maybe three or four additional sites and some roving testing facilities. But again, if you're interviewing uh, healthcare providers around the state, it seems like people have different ideas about who should be able to get a test and who shouldn't. Because we also interviewed some people who did get tests who had no more symptoms than uh, than Miss Means, but their doctor was was able to get them to test, and and her doctor wasn't. It it's it's a uh, it's 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 unfortunate. There are such different uh, standards and different understandings of what is supposed to happen. That leads to the fear and the confusion, and as Mr. Uh, Young pointed out, mistrust. Georgia ranks 40th in tests per resident, and that's even as the governor is going ahead and uh, and calling for some businesses to open. Vanessa, the opening of businesses puts business owners, it puts workers at businesses in a tough position um, because then you've got to decide if you're if you can afford not to open. You know, if, if the businesses are closed, it's sort of a clear cut choice has been made for you. But if you have the opportunity to open and your boss tells you you have to come back to work, you, you're forced to make yet another difficult decision. Um, and, and so, you know, your reporting is, is looking at just who in Georgia has to go back to work because there are some who have, frankly, the privilege to work from home or, or keep their kids at home. And then there are other people who might work at a barber shop or might work at a bowling alley who now have to get back to work. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. Uh, again, a lot of our, our reporting was focused in Southwest Georgia, where people are still afraid because, as one or two of them pointed out, you know, in these small towns, when one person gets sick or one person gets die or dies, everybody knows who they who that is. So they're still afraid. So the business people we talked to was very interesting. I talked to a restaurant owner and a woman who owned a uh, a beauty salon, and both of them said they were going to wait. Uh, because they felt like they needed more time to sort of understand how they could even try to open their businesses and keep their customers and their employees safe. Uh, you know, what, is it, what does it mean to, to serve, uh, to, to have your restaurant uh, open and, and how, do, how does a waiter or waitress serve somebody uh, and, and, uh, and, you know, sort of practice social distancing? Uh, they were they were trying to order masks. They were trying to order gowns. They were trying to order gloves and they just didn't have a lot of of, uh, of help. So they said that, yeah, they, they really would like to get back to work. They're small business people, they've been hurting, but they're also very concerned about spreading the disease. So they weren't gonna force any of their workers to come back. But um, we didn't uh, get too deeply into it, but some of our other colleagues have done reporting about what's happening with uh, people who work in uh, some of the meat, uh, uh, food processing plants who are, you know, who either you go back to work or you lose your job. Uh, and some of the other people that we interviewed who work in hospitals, who work in municipal services, they can't very well, uh, you know, not show up. Uh, so, yeah, there is there are concerns and people are just still trying to figure it out. And one of the frustrations is that they don't feel like they have a lot of help from the federal government, from the local government in trying to navigate this new uh, this new way of doing business, if you will. Mm. Um, there is 
the history and the the sort of the backstory of racial inequality and what's been at play in Georgia, um, Medicaid expansion. You know, it's not happened in a place like Georgia where the governor has been, you know, and others have been resistant to that. So we see a phenomenon where African-Americans uh, are less likely to be insured. There's not that ability to get on Medicaid in that greater way where some states have chosen to expand the Medicaid coverage. You know, I'd love to hear from you, Vanessa, about, you know, it's like the iceberg. We're seeing this tip of it right now with coronavirus, but there's this huge uh, block underneath the water that's making everything so much worse and even more of a crisis situation in southwestern Georgia. True. And not just there, um, across the state and in red states, or I shouldn't say that, and in <laughs> states where uh, officials declined to expand Medicaid. And that's, that has been a lot of Southern states, a lot of states that are, that are ruled, run by Republicans. And, and it's interesting, a lot of the healthcare providers we talked to in, in, the, in, the, in the region, as well as other parts of the state, really said that, um, that, that expanding Medicaid could help not only individuals to have uh, insurance, but it would help those uh, little small hospitals that and, and clinics that are trying to uh, serve people. Uh, I think Georgia has had something like seven or eight rural hospitals closed within the past decade, and um, ad administrators and and say that you know if they were able to get some reimbursement through Medicaid uh, by expanding affordable health, uh, the Affordable Health Care Act or Medicaid uh, expansion, then they could keep facilities open. People would have. Uh, some means to pay something that would help with their cash flow. Uh, and the, the pandemic has really put a strain on a lot of those facilities. In fact, one hospital might close if, you know, uh, because it's had to take on uh, more responsibility uh, for patients. Uh, there was a hospital in one county that had to take patients from a nursing home after an outbreak there. So they're just, a, a, there's a lot of stress and a lot of pain, a lot of uh, uh, strain, I meant to say, I'm sorry. That um, and but it'll be interesting to see whether after this is all over, those officials who have been opposed to a Medicaid expansion, citing the cost, will change their minds and say, "Well, maybe you know that that's the best we can do to help people who won't be able to afford healthcare any other way, and who won't be able to help those uh, medical facilities stay in business uh, and and be able to serve those vulnerable communities." I'd like to welcome Rosalind Helderman, political enterprise reporter. Uh, Ros, thank you for being with us. One last question for you, Vanessa, before we let you go. You, know, you just mentioned you'll be watching to sort of see um, how uh, governors are thinking about uh, medical care and coverage for their constituents in the coming weeks and months and even years. What else are you going to be watching coming from Georgia? Like, you know, as you talk to sources and, and track this story as businesses open, what questions are you going to be asking? Well, I think... I still think one of the, the main questions is um, just sort of the future uh, of healthcare. I think, as you pointed out, these dis uh, disparities have been there for generations. Uh, and this, this, um, this pandemic has laid bare uh, the facts that everybody, know, that everybody knew about. So th the question is, you know, how officials respond and how voters respond, you know, in, in the coming years. If people finally say, well, maybe we uh, <laughs> maybe we should elect people who are going to expand, uh, you know, healthcare, or uh, or you know, another a big issue that ties into this is even uh, rural access to um, to the internet. Mm -hmm. You know, now since doctors have had to close their offices, they can't see their patients in person. They have to do the telehealth. There are a lot of places out there have no access. And I talked to one lawmaker who said they've been debating this. Uh, for years and years and years. So the question will be, will public officials uh, change uh, their behaviors and you know, sort of what will, uh, what will voters do? What will voters decide uh, that it, it's time to you know, uh, make changes and, and let people know these are the issues and the, the priorities that we think are important. And you know, so it'll be interesting to see how people, how the public responds, uh, the voting public responds as well as uh, officials. All right, Vanessa, thank you so much. Vanessa Williams, thank appreciate you. your time. Ross Helderman, you were reporting on cruise ships and, you know, cruise ships are fascinating because we've been watching, you know, as cruise ships have been um, uh, locations for coronavirus to spread. And we've also watched the cruise ship be so dramatically impacted like the airline industry by this. Um, and, and so your, your piece is a fascinating read. 
It's also very important to the larger public health question of just what role the cruise ships played in spreading coronavirus and being part of that, that growth that happened both in the United States and overseas. So um, take us through uh, the cruise ships and, and let's start with this. Why are they you know, vulnerable places? What, what makes a cruise ship kind of like the, the Petri dish of viruses? Yeah, well, thanks for having me first, Libby. It's good to see you. Um, yeah. Uh, so if you think about a cruise ship, um, uh, one thing that sort of separates it from um, other uh, places is that they're enormous. The modern day cruise ship often has 2,000, 2,500, sometimes 3,000 passengers on it. Um, and even though the ships themselves are large, uh, the spaces on board tend to be rather confined. People are in tiny cabins. They eat typically communally um, in large restaurants, often in buffets. Um, so you cram together large number of people uh, in small spaces for lengthy periods of time. Often cruises are 10 days, two weeks. Um, often their populations are older. That just happens to be who likes to go on cruises, retirees, sometimes medically fragile people. And the last thing about them that's really important to remember is it's all these people together for long periods of time. And then they're mobile, right? That's kind of the key thing about a cruise ship. They are going from place to place. And the whole point is that the people go from port to port. Uh, and so anything that's on board a cruise ship uh, ends up being carried from place to place. So, you know, you and your, your colleagues talk about these two cruise ships in particular. And, and one of the moments where, what a lovely gesture, the, the, everyone is called onto the deck to applaud National Service uh, healthcare workers or healthcare workers generally, um, a thoughtful gesture, but at the same time, it brought everybody together in this like shoulder to shoulder situation at a time when it turns out coronavirus was on these vessels. Right. So we focused on uh, two ships, actually, where that happened. And part of the reason why we wanted to write about those two ships is just because of how late things happened on them. I mean, people may remember that there was like one of the very early dramas in the coronavirus story that people followed all over the world was this cruise ship in Japan, the Diamond Princess, uh, where they learned they had coronavirus on board. And suddenly it seemed hundreds of people had it. But people remember that took place in February. That was a long time ago, before we really fully understood coronavirus. Uh, the two ships that we wrote um, more than others about in this story, we wrote a lot about a number of ships, but two we really focused on were ships that uh, were out at sea uh, when the cruise industry formally stopped setting forth for new voyages. And so then they had to get home. And the people on board were being told repeatedly as they were on these long sails to try to get to home ports that there was no coronavirus on board. There was no need to quarantine to their rooms. There was no re reason to stop going to the pool or to the restaurants or to communal events like these uh, ceremonies that you mentioned where people gather together to actually applaud healthcare workers back on shore. And um, we have this photo of uh, one of those events from the celebrity eclipse. And you look at that photo with the eyes of a person who's been, you know, under work from home or quarantine for a number of weeks. And it's sort of shocking. It's all these people crammed together around the pool, some people in the hot tub, and they're being told there is no coronavirus on board. And there was. Uh, and now those people uh, finally on that particular ship got home on March 30th, and a number of them have died and, and uh, quite, a, uh, and dozens of them have tested positive for the virus. You know, at, at the time, th th there were illnesses on board, but the people on the ship were, were not being told it was coronavirus. In fact, they were being told that uh, coronavirus was not on the ship. Like they yeah. were in a little safe haven while coronavirus was happening in the rest of the world. Exactly. So I spoke to a number of people uh, who said that they were not feeling well, that they were having flu-like symptoms, and they went to the medical clinic on that ship and were told by the ship's staff um, you know, they never actually mentioned the possibility of coronavirus. They were told it was a cold. They were told it was likely uh, the flu. In fact, uh, there was one man who I interviewed, Dave Nystrom, whose wife spent the last four days of the cruise essentially admitted to the clinic in a bed in the clinic with fever, shortness of breath, the whole bit. Uh, she was evacuated from the ship when it docked by an ambulance. She tested positive for coronavirus within 10 hours and ultimately spent 22 days on a ventilator. And so there's a lot of signs that 
they should have had sort of the imagination to realize there's coronavirus all over the world. There might well be coronavirus on this cruise ship. Now, uh, that was a, a cruise ship um, operated by Celebrity, which is owned by Royal Caribbean. Uh, Royal Caribbean told us that uh, they actually did not have an abnormally high number of people on that ship reporting flu-like symptoms. You know, it's a ship with like 3,000 people on board. There's always some number of people going to the clinic saying they have a fever, saying they have a cough, and they have sort of algorithms for at what point does that number become high enough that they start to fear an outbreak. And they just say, at least, that they genuinely did not think they had an outbreak on their hands. So despite some early warnings, Roz, uh, the cruise ship industry was sort of not docked, right? And, and there are questions being raised about the power of the cruise ship industry, just who they were lobbying, and uh, just whose ear they had to keep business going. And no one, of course, is doubting uh, the economic impact of the cruise ship industry, but, but what powers were at play here? Yeah, so, you know, I talked about the Diamond Princess. After that, there was another cruise ship, the Grand Princess, that was coming in. You know, people, a lot of people watched that live, that cruise ship come into Oakland. And when people got off that ship, they were actually quarantined on military bases by the U.S. government. And so there became this question, you know, that's a lot of U.S. resources being put for this one industry. What should be done? Uh, and there was a brief time period where the cruise industry was really lobbying hard, uh, the White House, the coronavirus virus task force to be allowed to sort of implement voluntary measures, more health screenings, requiring people over 70 to get a note from their doctors. Uh, and that there was a bit of dithering uh, that happened while that conversation uh, was underway. Uh, and then finally, on March 13th, uh, the industry said, fine, we will, we will stop new, new sales. Uh, and you know, what they would say is that at the time they were still sailing, a lot of things were still happening. Airplanes were still flying. A lot of people were still going to work, but what their passengers say is, you know, you, you had a warning that other industries didn't, you watched this on some of your own cruise ships and, uh, you know, you, you should have stopped sooner. Okay, let's talk about the spread of coronavirus cases. There are concerns about how the virus spread in the Caribbean and the role that cruise ships played. Um, I wanna hear from you about that, but we also saw a big driver of cases in Australia was an outbreak on a cruise ship. And then even some place like Iowa, a lot of the early cases there were also from a cruise ship. Yeah. So, you know, this is one of those things where, um, you know, someday epidemiologists, other people have access to all the data are going to have to take a really close look at this. The CDC has done some work. Uh, they found that 17% of all U.S. cases in the first few weeks of coronavirus could be linked to cruise ships. But, you know, the cruise industry has pushed back very hard and they've insisted that, uh, you know, there is not yet evidence that they actually spread the virus uh, to new places. Uh, but, you know, there, there is some data that that is exactly what happened. Um, Australia, as you mentioned, is a place where the government has really been taking a close look at this. Um, they have a lot of cruise ships. Um, even, even now, I believe they have some cruise ships offshore filled with crew who haven't been able to get home. And Australia has said that as much as 10% of their total caseload has been linked to cruise ships. They actually have uh, opened a criminal investigation into one of, into one of those um, ships. Uh, you mentioned Iowa also, that's another place. Um, you know, in the first few days of March, Iowa was sort of announcing its new cases day by day. And for a series of days, up to their first 16 cases, they all were from the same group of people who had been on a cruise in Egypt on the Nile River. And, you know, that river cruise in, in Egypt uh, appears to have at least brought the first diagnosed cases of coronavirus back to Iowa in the middle of the U.S. All right, Roz Helderman, thank you so much uh, for being with us. I'm looking forward to seeing what you report on next um, as part of your investigations of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Thank you so much, Roz. Thank you. And stay with us because coming up, we'll be talking about just where things are at with finding uh, treatments and vaccines for coronavirus. Stay with us. These days, it's anything but business as usual. That's why working together is more important than ever. AT&T is committed to keeping you connected so you can keep your patients cared for, your customers served, your students inspired, and your employees closer than ever. Our network is resilient. Our people are strong. Our job is to keep your business connected. It's what we've always done. It's what we'll always do. 
My guest is Christopher Rowland, a business reporter with the Washington Post. Chris, there is a big appetite for finding a treatment for coronavirus from everyone to the president on down. But as you report, we should not expect a magic bullet. Yeah, Where are I things be, at in yeah. the process of treatments? It really is. Um, so, you know, what uh, when Ross was talking about the Diamond Princess, actually, the one of the first people to go into a trial for one of the most promising treatments, uh, remdesivir, a drug by, uh, made by Gilead, was from the Diamond Princess, was ev uh, evacuated to Nebraska to a national quarantine session and quickly enrolled in one of the first most vigorous and rigorous uh, double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trials for what is the most promising drug for a treatment. Uh, and even that drug has very mixed results so far, and it's not clear how well it's going to work. So uh, it is a sort of a, a kind of a mixed situation with um, the amount of hope versus sort of, you know, realism out there on the, uh, on the treatment front. You've got many, many different companies trying all different kinds of treatments uh, from things that treat inflammation to things that attack virus, old antivirals. Obviously, you've seen President Trump, you know, kind of flogging from the White House hydroxychloroquine, which has turned out to be uh, not a very effective drug at all, it appears, and also may actually have more harm than good because it has serious cardiac side effects. Um, mm -hmm. This week, later on, there might be some results from remdesivir that could give us a sense of whether or not there's going to be uh, you know, a more uh, effective treatment on the horizon. A lot of the experts I've talked to say, yes, indeed, there is no magic bullet coming, and that um, what, we're, what may be likely is that uh, there's a drug like remdesivir that if you take it early enough and it attacks the virus, that could help you. And then more anti-inflammatory treatments for the later stages of the disease, which are in more like the second week and the third week when people are very, very sick and they get slammed with their, uh, the, you know, the inflammation response to the lungs. And if you can treat inflammation at that point. But right now, there's nothing proved for treatment. And it's, you know, it's looking kind of mixed, I would say. Um, there's not yeah. cause for a really, uh, you know, any celebration soon. I want to ask you about remdesivir because just your reporting helped me learn a lot about what we're talking about here. You, you explained that this is a broad spectrum antiviral, which means it can work against a lot of viruses. Now, antiviral is a word that I've heard a lot, of course, but I, but I hadn't really thought about what that means and, and how a drug like that would be targeted um, to deal with viruses. So how do you battle like a virus versus a bacteria, say? Yeah, so people are really familiar with, you know, antibiotics like, uh, you know, a penicillin or amoxicillin or things that, you know, we use a lot to treat, you know, everyday strep throat and things like that. Um, uh, antivirals are uh, harder to come up with because a virus is a much different critter than a bacteria. And, it's hard, and they have much more unique characteristics for every single virus. And so you actually have to come up with a very targeted treatment to, to actually beat back a virus. Whereas, uh, so there, there was a lot of hope for remdesivir because it seemed to have a broad effect in, um, in the lab, in, in vitro, as they say, in Petri dishes. And so it, could, it would wipe out or, re or prevent lots of different kinds of virus from replicating. Uh, then they tried it uh, in Ebola in Africa during an outbreak last year, and it didn't really work very well. So, um, but hopes remained high that it would uh, go up against well, measure up well against coronavirus, uh, and the, including the novel coronavirus. And so now we've seen some mixed results that have been leaked out so far. Uh, the, the person I was telling you about in the Diamond Princess, in that clinical trial, which is being sponsored by the NIH, it is the most rigorous, best clinical trial and there won't be results for another month. Mm. Um, Chris, we had a, a, a question written in from a viewer. Pamela wrote from Sonoma County, California, and asked this, what's happening with the plasma that survivors are donating? So if you can answer that or just give us any sense of like what you know, people who've had coronavirus, especially people who've had you know, sort of a severe reaction to it, how are they helping the effort to, to find solutions? Um, so uh, convalescent plasma is a, uh, a treatment that's being tried. It's been tried. It's a long standing kind of tactic to try to fight uh, disease. So people who have been infected with a, disease, uh, a virus 
uh, they develop the antibodies in their blood. So once they recover, they can give their blood um, and the plasma can be you know, sort of distilled out, if you will, and then uh, given to somebody who is, uh, you know, th uh, has the disease or is threatened with the disease. And the effort that, you know, the idea is that the antibodies from the previously infected person will now go into the new person and help them fight the virus. Uh, this is being tried um, and there are clinical trials underway uh, to try um, convalescent plasma against um, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, 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 SARS and uh, so far, the, it's not- That's the official technical term right. of what we're talking that's about. That's the designation of the virus. COVID-19 is the disease. The, okay. SARS-CoV-2 causes COVID-19. So, um, and uh, so far, you know, the jury's still out. It's not clear if that's gonna work. It, I think a lot of people are very hopeful it will work. Again, you know, preliminary results have shown some mixed results. You know, people are waiting to see if, is there gonna be anything that just, you know, is cures 98% of the people or 90% of the people. So far, we haven't come across that. But uh, plasma is definitely a, you know, an option that people are trying. Does it matter, Chris, if it's plasma from someone who um, just had like a mild case of it and proved to be very resilient to it versus someone who got really sick? I don't know the answer to that question, I'm afraid. Yeah, um, I don't know. We'll look into it. <laughs> Talk more about it next week. Um, I, I want to get a sense from you of how this works at the government level versus like private companies. And, and is there sort of like a race uh, is the race on to figure out treatments and vaccines and then how much collaboration can take place if, if, uh, if, if we're trying to see, you know, if, if private companies versus, you know, public efforts gain. Yeah, right. absolutely. There, there, there's definitely, uh, you know, a race going. It's a two prong race. One is for the treatments. The other is for the vaccine. Uh, the government is pouring money into both spaces, but I would say uh, the, 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 the bigger expenditures that are happening uh, by the government, by um, an agency called BARDA, which is in uh, HHS, uh, are in the vaccine space where they're spending, um, you know, a billion or more on trying to accelerate uh, the development of a vaccine and also to ramp up um, uh, manufacturing of vaccines. So you very much see, you know, a partnership in that space. Um, for example, Johnson & Johnson has received uh, almost $500 million from the federal government to develop uh, a new type of vaccine uh, and also to ramp up manufacturing so that they can have the capacity to start creating vaccine as quickly as, as one is found. You know, the big challenge is, can you make enough fast enough? But again, you know, the earliest a vaccine could come online would be 12 to 18 months is the, is the best estimate right now. President Trump halted U.S. money going to the World Health Organization or WHO. What's the role of the WHO in trying to find treatments and a vaccine? So the WHO uh, plays a crucial role and a vital role in sort of harnessing, uh, you know, um, intellectual capital around the world, trying to, to build consensus among governments on how to um, attack the virus. Uh, it also uh, is a good um, advocate for disadvantaged countries, uh, underdeveloped countries that don't have uh, medical, strong medical infrastructure and don't have access to medications. They can hold the uh, feet to the fire of the developed countries to try to get them, uh, you know, to donate medicine, donate money to help. Um, the WHO is running uh, four clinical trials of potential treatments right now, including uh, hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir, as well as an anti-inflammatory. Um, and they are also uh, working hard now, they announced just last week, on how to come up with a protocol where if, when there is a vaccine developed, how do we distribute it around the world fairly? Uh, that's another big role for the WHO to, uh, to play because it's gonna be, you know, the disadvantaged countries, uh, third world countries are, are gonna have to line up and advocate to get access to vaccines. And whereas the, uh, you know, Western countries uh, that are the homes to the multinational pharmaceutical corporations will be first in line for the vaccine. So it's a very, a geopolitical question that has to be resolved and the WHO will play a major role in that. You were just reporting a few days ago that the Food and Drug Administration has been warning doctors not to use these anti-malarials of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine uh, to treat uh, COVID-19 patients. This, even though President Trump has been aggressively touting them and saying that they were uh, a solution. So, so why is the FDA weighing in and uh, what does that tell us about 
the, you know, the right hand talking to the left hand or working together as sort of one federal government body, I guess. You know, so the FDA was in a very tough spot. You know, they were being pressured very aggressively by the president and his team uh, to issue an emergency youth author uh, emergency emergency use authorization uh, for hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, uh, and they did so um, on, with no evidence of effectiveness. And this was uh, back at the beginning of the month, around uh, March first, uh, uh, March thirtieth or April first. Now, three weeks later. They've been forced to issue a very stern warning after there have been a number of, of adverse events associated with those drugs. Those drugs ha, uh, can cause arrhythmia, and arrhythmia can cause uh, sudden cardiac death. And so they have had a number of those adverse events, including deaths. They don't disclose how many. But um, it shows that you know, probably there's many critics who will say the FDA acted way too hastily. The Trump administration was pushing much too hard uh, to get these drugs out there. New York is still you know, they, they're they taking uh, millions of doses and giving them to people under a massive, what amounts to a massive clinical trial right in the city. And the state is gathering the evidence to see whether or not these drugs work. But so far, they've not been shown in any rigorous setting to have any effect against coronavirus. Um, Chris, what are you going to be watching for next? Well, the next thing to watch, the most immediate thing on the horizon is there's going to be probably later this week, uh, the results uh, from a Gilead-sponsored trial of remdesivir. So Gilead Sciences, San Francisco-based company, is the company that manufactures remdesivir. And they have run a very large-scale trial, 6,000 people. The problem with that trial is that it does not have a placebo-controlled arm. So they don't have anything good to compare it to, right? So it's going to be kind of this amorphous data point. But it will help whether or not, it will help determine whether or not there is some benefit to this drug and whether or not it has some effect, but how much effect it has won't be known from this trial. And also whether what adverse events uh, stem from remdesivir also will be difficult to tell because you don't have that, you know, a population where you're, that's not getting, that's getting a placebo and not getting the drug to, to really, that's the gold standard of way to do a clinical trial. We have to wait till next month for the NIH trial to be done uh, with uh, almost a thousand people and once that's done, then we'll have a really good sense of whether remdesivir is a good drug, a strong drug, or not. So far, the and then the other things that to watch out for are, um, uh, you know, the WHO is running some clinical trials. Uh, you know, the convalescent plasma. There's you know small trials going on for that. Uh, there's trials for stem cell uh, applications. There's trials in the works uh, for different drugs that treat uh, inflammation. Um, uh, to try to defeat that uh, cytokine storm in the lungs that just is really the cause of death for many, many people with uh, coronavirus. Um, and so, you know, whether or not any of these trials uh, produces something that gives people hope uh, is what we're looking out for next. And the other thing is to see, uh, you know, whether or not in the months to come, the, over the summer, whether or not an effective vaccine emerges that can then be put into further more advanced clinical trials and then can be manufactured. And that's what will give people hope heading into the fall. But right now, the whole, the pharmaceutical world right now is not offering a lot of um, uh, magic bullets, as you might say. Final question for you, a search for a vaccine versus a search for treatment. Is one really the focus over the other? Are pharmaceutical companies and governmental agencies able to sort of split their focus? Um, are they just so fundamentally different that Pharmaceutical companies already have the ability to be looking for like antiviral treatments while a vaccine is also in the works or a vaccine attempt is in the works. Well, uh, so, you know, the, the unfortunate reality is that both of these spaces have been neglected by manufacturing uh, by pharmaceutical companies for years because essentially there's no these are not profitable spaces for big drug companies like J&J &J and Pfizer and GlaxoSmithKline to be in. So they haven't spent heavily on creating uh, antiviral treatments, and they have not created the infrastructure that they need to ramp up fast to have a vaccine. So they're playing catch up on all fronts. But to answer your question more directly, yes, uh, they're definitely highly focused on both channels. Uh, there's some companies that are specializing in treatments, some companies that are specializing in vaccines. A lot of them, there are the smaller biotechs that are looking to partner up with the big drug companies like that I mentioned, the big multi national pharmaceutical corporations that have the expertise to really ramp up and manufacture or to have the, the big bucks to come in and help them develop those drugs. 
But um, so you've got, uh, you know, very intense activity going on in the in smaller biotech sectors for vaccines and treatments, um, at, you know, in college labs, in small little labs all over Cambridge, San Francisco, you know, big, different biotech centers um, and large pharmaceutical corporations. It's 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 worldwide. It's going on all over the place and it's very intense on both tracks. All right, Chris Rowland, business reporter at the Washington Post. Thank you so much, Chris, for being with us. And I kept you longer than planned. So thanks to you. Thanks to your editor. Um, really appreciate your time, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Take yeah. care, Libby. Take care. Be healthy. And thank you to our audience for watching um, this special report from the Washington Post. I'm Libby Katie. We will be back on Thursday afternoon at three o'clock Eastern time with more of the latest news. Stay well.